Hello everyone, I'm the Canadian Gaming Penguin. As many of you know, the first day of the Digital Fan Festival 2021 around the world took place on May 14th or 15th, depending on your time zone. The first event of the Digital Fan Festival was the keynote address, and with it was the first look at the extended Endwalker trailer. My comments on the trailer are, holy Hannah does it look good. The trailer, I mean. Uh, oh, and yes, the Endwalker expansion looks good too. <laughs> Uh, yes, I know, lame joke. I'll have plenty of those later, too. While I won't be going through the trailer in this video, or likely any video, unless there's interest in me doing so, I will be mentioning it periodically throughout this video. That said, I would like to point out my favorite part of the trailer, at least in the visual sense, and it is this. I really love the look of this place, which I will refrain from saying the name of for now, as I will be mentioning it again later on in this video. Uh, that said, let's get right into the keynote address. I will note, however, right away that the keynote address is about the Endwalker expansion, and as such, there will be spoilers in this video. If you'd like a shortened, less spoilery summary of the keynote address, you can find that in my day one summary video of the Digital Fan Festival. Anyways, let's get to the keynote address. After the extended trailer for Endwalker was played, the director and producer of Final Fantasy XIV, Naoki Yoshida, aka Yoshi P, appeared on stage in costume. The costume? Why, it was for the new melee DPS job. More on that in a bit. Yes, I know I mean. <laughs> After Yoshi P made a few opening remarks, he invited Michael Christopher Koji Fox, aka Koji, onto the stage. Koji, of course, provided the English interpretation for Yoshi P. Yoshi P took the time to attempt to read some comments from the different streams, but was unable to, unable to do so as they were moving away too fast for him to read any. Uh, naturally, as he was trying to read each of the three stream chats in turn, the speed of which comments were appearing increased, surprising and no one. And next, Yoshi P jokingly said that he'd like to spend the next two hours talking about the diet that he was on in order to maintain his weight so that his costume would still fit. Of course, that was merely a joke, and of course the keynote address would be talking about Endwalker. Oh, and that wasn't the last time the diet would be mentioned. <laughs> Anyways, after the comment reading attempt by Yoshi P, the keynote address really began. Coming with the Endwalker expansion is the new melee DPS job, Reaper. To introduce this new job, we were shown a short preview trailer for it. It looks awesome. I have to say that it's intrigued me in that we have basically confirmation that we can harness the power of and or control of, in some ways, the Void Scent. I'm beginning to wonder if the Void Scent are really... bad. I will leave it at that, as that's a whole different story to dive into. Anyways, we were also told that a certain Garlean will be changing jobs to the Reaper job, and we can see this Garlean as the Reaper job in the extended trailer for Endwalker. In fact, we were told that we would actually see this change sooner than later, so watch out for it. And I can indeed confirm this to be true now that patch 5.55 is out. The Garlean in question is, of course, a Xenos, which doesn't surprise me. It does have, however, blah, blah. it does, however, have me a little concerned. Anywho, the Reaper job is an original job to Final Fantasy in that you will not find the Reaper job in any of the previous Final Fantasy games. As for future games, who knows? We were then given the details of the Reaper job. The Reaper job will be a melee DPS, with its armor subclass being the same as Dragoon. Thus, it will be using the Maiming gear set. The two-handed weapon that the Reaper job will use is, of course, a scythe. The requirements to start this job is firstly owning the Endwalker expansion and having at least one job at level 70. The job will begin in Ulda, so if you want to be one of the first people to start the job, make sure to log out in Ulda before the launch of Endwalker. Uh, the starting level for Reaper will be level 70. We were given additional details about the Reaper job, such as it wields a scythe for dynamic close quarter combat, and that it calls upon an avatar from the Void to join in battle. We will be given additional details about the Reaper job in the near future. 
After that, we were given the chance to watch the Reaper trailer once more, and if you're interested in watching the trailer yourself, it can be found on the Final Fantasy XIV YouTube channel. I will also note right away that any of the videos that I mentioned uh, mentioned were played during the keynote address can also be found on the Final Fantasy XIV YouTube channel. Next up, talking about the storyline of the game, specifically the Hydaelyn and Zodiac sto storyline. As we were told during the announcement showcase, the storyline with Hydaelyn and Zodiac will conclude with Endwalker, that is, with 6.0. Patch 6.1 will begin a new storyline altogether. We were reminded once again that this does not mean that Final Fantasy XIV will be ending. Yoshi P considers Final Fantasy XIV to be his life's work, and he plans on continuing to work on Final Fantasy XIV past, past 6.0. Woot. Less sarcastic than it sounded. <laughs> As shown in the extended trailer, we will have a new city hub similar to that of the Crystarium on the 1st. And this is the area that I mentioned before being my favorite part of the trailer, because it looks gorgeous, in among other things. Anyways, this new area is called Old Charlian. With this new area, we were shown a preview video along with some screenshots. We were also reminded that they are still in development mode, so the environmental effects, etc. will still be adjusted in among other things. Uh, during and after we were seeing this new area, amusingly, the, streams com the stream comment sections were also asking about when we would get housing in this area. <laughs> Yoshi P said, Ishgard is next. Not here, Ishgard. <laughs> uh, following that, we were then given a bit of a history lesson about Final Fantasy XIV. Originally, there was a plan to have six starting cities, and holy hannah, that would have been a lot. These six starting cities would have been Ulda, Limsa Grigdania, Alamigo, Ishgard, and Charlian. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, there apparently wasn't enough time to develop all of them, and I have to say I'm kind of glad for that, because if they had all been the starting cities, the story of Final Fantasy XIV would be vastly different. I would expect that Ishgard would never have been closed off, Alamigo would never have needed to be liberated, Charlian would never have, well, become Idleshire. Uh, anyways, I digress. Yoshi P then took a moment to talk about the trailer, and if you recall or saw or heard the teaser trailer for the Endwalker expansion, the background singing was more murmurs than singing. <laughs> well, in this extended version, there were some changes, and I'll get to what those changes are in a second. For a bit of background, the Endwalker theme was composed by Masayoshi Soken, the lyrics written by Michael Christopher Kochi Fox and Natsuko Ishikawa, the main vocals are by Sam Carter from The Architects, with additional vocals by Amanda Akin, and the music is performed by The Primals. Apparently, Koji in Ishikawa only had three to four days to work on the lyrics, which, believe it or not, was a long time compared to the time with figuring out lyrics for Sophia, which was only two hours. Yikes. Anyways, so the changes about with the extended trailer were the parts where there were lyrical parts in that the lyrics were sung by Sam Carter along with Amanda Akin in the respective spots, if that wasn't confusing at all. <laughs> You'll just have to watch the trailers in comparison and figure it out. And you may also recognize Amanda Akin's vocals as she is also the vocalist in the Tomorrow and Tomorrow song. Then the keynote address moves on to talk about some of the characters that we see in the trailer. First on that list of characters is Astinian. As we can see in the extended trailer, Astinian takes on a slightly different appearance. Well, sort of. He has no helm, as we've been accustomed to seeing him without one for a while now. Additionally, his hair is up, and that is because his hair kept clipping into his gear. So, quest designer Saki Takayanagi suggested that to remedy the situation, they should have Astinian's hair up, and voila. I'm so glad that they did that because it drives me nuts when the hair clips into the gear, especially during a cutscene that doesn't involve a player-customized character. It, it's more understandable when it's a character that is customized by players, but I digress. 
With this Ninian's appearance, the music in the trailer changes to Heaven's Ward, and I love that transition. It was also mentioned as a reminder that Estinian will be joining us throughout the storyline, as well as being part of the Endwalker Dungeon Trust system, which makes sense because he has now joined the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. Woot! Another character that we saw in the trailer and was pointed out to us was the dragon that Estinian rides in on in the trailer. I think what Estinian calls the dragon and what Yoshi P and Koji repeated was the name Vitra, or something like that. We'll assume that I have the name correct and go with it. So Vitra is actually one of the first brood, like Bahumut, Race Felger, Nidhogg, Tiamat, etc. And that was all the information that they shared with us about Vitra. If we want more information about Vitra, we will have to wait, naturally. The next character is this fellow, whose name was unknown to me during the keynote address, but is now known to me as I've completed the main scenario quests that were released with the patch 5.55. Patch 5.55. I think I added an extra five the first time. Anyways, I'll not say who this person is in the event that you're not yet at that point. I will say I was surprised to find out who he is, and that's all I'm going to say. At any rate, during the keynote address, we were told that we would learn of him with the patch uh, patch 5.5 part 2 main scenario quest, so we didn't have to wait long to find out who he was, uh, sort of. It definitely beats having to wait till November anyways. Anywho, even before this, there may have been some people that already knew who he was. Apparently, if people had read the encyclopedia, whichever one that is, they may have already known who he was, or at least that's what Yoshi P said. At any rate, I hadn't read that, and I didn't know at the time, but now I do. Obviously. <laughs> and next in the keynote address, we were given additional information about some of the new areas we can expect in the Endwalker expansion. To start this section off with the keynote address, we were shown a few trailers of new er of these new areas, starting with Labyrinthos. I love the music in this video, which I will assume is the area music for Labyrinthos. After the video, we were shown screenshots of Labyrinthos, as Yoshi P gives us some additional details, including that Labyrinthos is underground. It is a subterranean area with a dome serving as its sky, lit by an artificial sun. Curious. Where Labyrinthos is actually located and why we have to travel to that area in the first place will be revealed to us as we play through the Endwalker story. Again, obviously. <laughs> and is it November yet? The next locations we looked at was Thavnir and Rads at Hand. We were reminded that we, were, we may have heard of these names before in-game, Thavnir being the origin area for the dancer job, and Rats at Han has been mentioned in other side quest type stuff as well. Then we were shown a short trailer for Thavnir in general and Rats at Han, which is a city within Thavnir. I can say with certainty that I love the music in both of these two videos. The Thavnir area area looks beautiful and very forest-like in the kind of tropical sense. And as for the rads at Handtown, I will admit that it's going to get some taking use to seeing all the vibrant colors and patterns within the town, um, but it reminds me of some areas in some more exotic places in the world, places I've never been to and likely won't ever be. I expect that the real-life equivalents are what inspired the design for this area, and while I'm not used to it, after having watched the video at least a dozen times now, mostly for the music, <laughs> it's starting to grow on me. And no, I'm not just saying that, I do actually mean it, even if my voice sounds a little flat. <laughs> uh. On another note, we were reminded that there are, uh, they are still in development phase, and what we see in the videos may not be the end result, as, for example, a lot of the environmental effects are not yet completed, and thus we're not in the videos. And I'll probably mention this at least once more in this video. <laughs> uh, it was definitely me mentioned a few times throughout the keynote address. Anyways, like with Labyrinthos, we were also shown some additional screenshots of Thavnair. Yoshi P then moved on to show us some artwork of another area, whose name was not revealed to us, 
And when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking of fairies when I see, and it was mentioned to us, that it sort of reminded them of Ilmeg and with the uh, pixies and stuff. <laughs> uh, because of how lush it looks, etc. is why I think of fairies. And also the fact that this is a floating city in the sky. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, next we were shown some screenshots of Garlemald. We were reminded that, as we know in patch 5.5, Carlemald has begun falling apart, so to speak, internally. As we can see in these images, I think it's safe to say that some sort of war or battle broke out here as to the why, when, how, etc. for the destruction. Well, we'll just have to wait to find out. We were also told that we would be able to explore around in the area, and that has me really curious. Mostly as to the reason behind our exploration in the area in the first place. Anyways, the next location that Yoshi P discussed is the moon, or more specifically the area on the moon which is called Mare Lamentorum. I think I said that correctly. <laughs> After showing us a couple of, piece of pieces of artwork, we were then shown a video of the Mare Lamentorum area, and this area... I won't quite say gorgeous because, well, it's on the moon, <laughs> but at the same time with the background of the stars, etc., it looks gorgeous. Uh, that said, I'm extremely curious as to what is on the moon and why we need to travel to the moon and why, why that particular music is used as the background music. I won't say which piece it is and you'll have to find out by watching the video or waiting until you get to that part of the storyline once Endwalker is out. Anyways, I'll leave it at that. On another note, it was unsurprising that the comment section then began to ask, when are we getting moon housing? <laughs> Anyways, that's it for the areas that were talked about during the keynote address. Yoshi P then tells us a bit about a few new groups of peoples we will come across in Endwalker. This includes the Magus Sisters, or Magus Sisters, however that's said, <laughs> which may look similar to previous versions of them in other Final Fantasy titles, but these sisters in Final Fantasy XIV will be original. And next, Yoshi P talked about the Aloparites, if I said that right, these adorable looking bunny creatures, and apparently we'll find them on the moon. Hmm... Did I mention that the Laparites are really adorable? Even if I did, they are adorable. We also don't know if they are a friend or foe, which leaves me inclined to say, never trust a bunny. Or a better theory, don't like bunnies at all, as they have two, quote, hoppy legs and twitchy little noses. <laughs> if anyone gets either of those two references, yay! If not, to quote again, I'll be over here. <laughs> Anyways. And the next part of the keynote address was to briefly recap the other content that is coming to the game in 6.0, that is with the Endwalker expansion. As some of this information in this brief recap is new, and I, however, I will be going over this rel relatively quickly as it it is, for the most part, just a recap. So, let's get to it. We know that there is a new healer job, Sage, and there will be a higher level cap from level 80 to level 90. There are going to be five role quest lines instead of the four in Shadow, four like in Shadowbringers, and these five role quest lines are Tank, Healer, Melee DPS, ranged DPS and magical ranged DPS, dividing up all of the DPSs so that they have their own respective stories. Next, the trust system will be updated, as I mentioned once or twice already in this video, with Estinian being able to participate in the dungeons of whatever variety that will be in the trust system. Anyways, a downscaled values in the battle calculations will be conducted or changed whatever, and we will have more information about this at a later date. Along with the belts that will no longer be around, we will have more information about that also at a later date. There's going to be a new small-scaled PvP mode, and this will be completely different to the current PvP system, and this new PvP system will also have a completely different reward system, and also more information about this will be given at a future time. 
With 6.0, there will also be a high-end eight-player raid, Pandemonium. This will be an original story. We will also have the Island Sanctuary, which will re which received a bigger response than they expected. And this will be released throughout the 6.0 series. And this is a type of thing that will give players a break from combat, competition, a chance for slow living. And it was reminded to, uh, we were reminded that this is not locked to crafters and gatherers. You will not need a crafter or gatherer job. A new residential district, Ishgard, will be open for viewing in 6.0, and it will be available for purchase in 6.1. And they are looking at making adjustments to housing. They are doing their best to stop the RMT purchasing and other housing cheats. And they are also working their best as they can, uh, best that they can to provide stability in the housing areas by purchasing more servers and working on the server infrastructure, etc. And among other things related to housing and trying to improve that aspect. There is also a new system, a data center travel system, which will allow players to play across different data centers. This is currently hard to work out as uh, there are zone servers, area servers, etc., which makes it hard to make sure that the data is not interrupted or corrupted. And thus there will be additional limits to what we can do in comparison to just the world visit system. And that's completely fair in my opinion. Also coming with 6.0 are challenging new dungeons. And with this, we were shown a preview video of the dungeons that we can play. And there is definitely a different atmosphere in each of the ones that we were shown. These ones that we were shown are also part of the storyline and they are trust system capable. So we will be able to see all of them. And there'll be additional dungeons as the expert dungeons at level 90. I will take a moment so that we can have a better look at the screenshots that I grabbed from the dungeon trailer we saw. And moving on. There's also a new alliance raid, a 24-man alliance raid specifically. This is about the Hydaelyn Heidel and Zodiac storyline. And the name of this is going to be Myths of the Realm and we will be exploring the 12 in a way we haven't been able to before. The storyline is an original concept. And we were asked if we recognized the 12 image that we were shown, and some people were, I hope, jokingly asking about whether or not the internal bonding area was going to transform, because this, of course, is also avail uh, shown on display in that area of the game. Anyways, that was it for the recap of the content coming with 6.0. And next, we were told about the different Endwalker expansion packages. Uh, first, we learned of the Final Fantasy XIV Collector's Edition and the physical items that comes with it, which we were able to see as in person as well as we could, after which we were then shown a video of one of the digital items, a new mount, Orion. The other digital rewards includes a wind-up Porum minion and a glamour item, Death Scythe. Apparently, the Death Scythe is similar to the one in Final Fantasy XI, but the Final Fantasy XIV version has more depth to it, or something like that. Anyways, then Yoshi P explained the differences between the different Endwalker expansion packages. It was also noted that the starting with the Endwalker expansion, there are no longer or there no longer will be any physical di disc packages. Anyways, as to the different Endwalker expansions, the Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker Collector's Edition is for those who play the game via Windows and Mac, note, not through Steam. This package includes all the physical items and all the digital items. The Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker Collector's Box is for those that play via PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and Steam. And this box has all the physical items. Thus, if you want the expansion itself, you will need to purchase the expansion via the respective stores and obtain the digital items via that means. If you want the physical rewards, you will need to purchase the box on the Square Enix store. Uh, but currently, all the physical reward packages are currently sold out. It is possible that they will restock the physical packages, but it's hard to say, partly because the production has been affected in all aspects around the world, 
and it's possible that they cannot produce more. But I don't actually know, I'm just assuming, so here's for hoping that they will have more available if in fact that is what you want. I know if I had the money to get it, I definitely would. I really like the paladin figure, <laughs> but say la vie. Anyways, the Final Fantasy XIV and Walker Digital's Collector's Edition includes all the digital items, hence the name, <laughs> and obviously does not include the physical rewards. Finally, there is the Final Fantasy XIV and Walker Standard Edition. This is just the expansion with no addi additional digital rewards. That said, there is also pre-order digital items, which are the Wind Up Hallum minion and the Minfil uh, Minfina earring, which is similar to the earring that was part of the pre-order bonus for Shadowbringers, the difference being that this one has an XP boost to level 80. And also as a pre-order digital item reward is the is early access to Endwalker, which would begin on November 19th, 2021. And it doesn't matter which package of Endwalker you buy, so long as you have pre-ordered it, you will get the pre-order items. It was also around this time that we learned that the Endwalker expansion will be released on November 23rd, 2021. Once again, I find my, uh, myself asking, is it November yet? <laughs> As a surprise to us, especially since it seemed like Yoshi P was beginning to wrap up the keynote address, we were given this announcement. Male Vera will be coming to the game with Endwalker. To announce this, we were played a video. At first, I thought it was sort of a joke about how Vera's haven't really been able to wear helms, so this was going to be a video showing that they could wear helms. And I mostly assumed that because the viewer in the video was adjusting his gear, etc. But then it pans higher, and then it becomes clear that this was de that there was something missing on the viewer that sort of made it more obvious that this was what was not, in fact, a female Vera. I hope I don't have to explain what I mean. Anyways, along with this, we were told that they are also working on a female Hrothgar, but it was not yet completed, and they decided to release one race at a time, uh, rather than waiting until both were ready. And they did not give us a timeline when we can expect the female Frothgar. I expect it's going to be a long while yet. The last part of the keynote address was to talk about the Oceania area getting a data center. Based on the map that we were shown, it looks like this data center will be located somewhere in Australia. Hopefully this significantly improves the gameplay for the Oceania players. Finally, to close the keynote address, and as part of the official opening of the Digital Fan Festival 2021, Square Enix CEO Yosuke Matsuda was welcomed to the stage, who was followed by Mina, who provided the English interpretation for Matsuda-san. Matsuda-san thanked all of us for tuning in and wanted to thank us for supporting them for the last 10 years. He also hoped that all of us would enjoy the new form of Fan Festival. I know I definitely did enjoyed it, and I hope I'll be able to participate and or attend a fan festival in the future. While technically not part of the keynote address, after Matsuda-san said all that he wished to say, the development team that would make appearances throughout day one were introduced. Following this, the Digital Fan Festival 2021 was officially opened, and thus had ended the first event of the Digital Fan Festival. Of course, this video is mostly about the keynote address. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I am super excited for the Endwalker expansion, even more so after having completed the main scenario quest that was part of the patch 5.55, which was also the last of the storyline until 6.0. Yay and boo at the same time. I want more now. Uh, is it November yet? In the meantime, however, I'm going to be continuing my playthrough of my journey to Endwalker, because much of the storyline I would like to be refreshed on, and the new game plus has its limits. Plus, I really like the story, and I don't mind playing through it again. Anywho, that is it for this video. It's a little more long-winded than I had intended to be, and out much later than I intended it to be, but I hope that you found this video helpful. Uh, thanks for watching.